you're muted. Sorry, I was saying let's give just one minute because I am seeing people still entering the room. Um, I said. So I'm here, maybe you can handle, I think Christine, I see Christine here. Um, ah, can you hear me? This is the one, can yeah, I just. We can hear okay. you. So uh, this hasn't started yet, right? Yes, we're gonna start yes, now. I, I was seeing yeah. more and more people entering the room, but we're gonna start now, okay? All right, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. We want to welcome all um, of you to the NIH workshop, uh, Choosing and Applying to Medical School. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the people from the NIH and also all those students who were accepted to our summer um, internship here that couldn't attend, and also all the students that are uh, attending today across the country. I think it's, it's great and exciting to have this opportunity this time, and, and we have the privilege to to reach, so it's, it's great to have you here. We have several hundreds of participants, so this is really exciting. Uh, so first of all, we'd like to tell you that we hope you and your families are safe and healthy, and that we know that these are challenging situations for many reasons, so we really appreciate and thank you for your interest in this, in this workshop. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Sukowski for being here. She is uh, the other pre-med advisor. And um, Dr. Sukowski, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Kristen Sukowski. Most students call me Dr. Z. Welcome. Um, I hope that we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions and give you some really valuable information today. Great. So my name, as you can see, is Dr. Elena Hernandez Ramon. I am the director of the pre-medical program here at the Office of the Intramural Training and Education, and I am a pre-med advisor too. Um, I have seen patients. I have worked uh, with research for many years, and I have also worked in the office, this office, for several years, advising and guiding students um, to successfully get into medical school. So we hope that you find this workshop helpful. Uh, we're going to move forward to some housekeeping items. So all of you are muted, but you can always um, send questions via uh, the, I think you have open the question box. I don't know if you have the chat box, but let's just use the question box. You can type there your questions and you are several hundred, so we're going to try to answer as many as possible. If you have issues with um, uh, audio or if you have issues with audio, probably you are not hearing me, but um, if you have some other issues, you can just log off and, and re-enter again, and usually that is fixed very quickly. Okay, um, the other common question, all this, this presentation is attached to this um, webinar, so if you go to handouts, you will have a copy of the slides there. Okay, so let's get started. So today plans, we are planning to cover these topics. Why medical school and why not? What is a competitive application? What are the, the components that we need to identify to have a competitive and a strong application? How to improve the elements of this application? Your timeline? A quick overview of the application process. I think it's important to know some details now, even if you are years away of your application. And also, very importantly, some resources for your wellness. So the, the first thing I'd like to do is to know what our audience is. So we're going to have our first poll just to see what is the training level uh, we have here. So let me open the poll. And we're going to uh, give you a few seconds here um, to answer this. If you're going to start answering this, that would be great. I see that you are already answering, and I have uh, more than half of you in college, junior, and senior year. Um, well, close to 50%. Let me just share this i think that most of you have responded keep it a few seconds more okay i think we are good so almost half of you 
college, junior or senior year, 28% freshman, sophomore, 15% in a post-bac or other um, enhancing gap year. Um, let me share this with you, 7% high school students, very nice. You are preparing on time and 4% of other. Um, I am not sure why this is asking me. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I am starting seeing some questions, but we're gonna review that later. Okay, so I can see that most of you are closer to the application time, and we are gonna adapt this presentation a little bit to address actually all questions and all um, trainee levels here. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to review with you is what are the reasons that you have in mind to want to become a doctor? When uh, the students come to our office, we usually ask these questions and it is just surprising to see, um, yeah, sometimes very good answers, but sometimes we have questionable reasons about that. So just want to emphasize the importance of knowing yourself, knowing your interests, your skills, your values, and once the idea of uh, becoming a physician crossed your mind, just make sure that you explore the field. This exploration is gonna be the clue to confirm your decision, right? And medical school admissions like to see that you have tested your interests, you have explored the field, you have volunteered, you have shadowed, you have been at the clinical environment to make sure that this is a good option for you. So I just uh, wanna share with you what are the good reasons I hear when students come to the office. Uh, and I put reasons in plural because it should be more than one. I often see uh, here people interested in life sciences, right? People interested in helping people. And this is a very interesting one because we know that you wanna help people However, many times when we have this conversation or when you are writing your personal statement, it comes across like the only or main reason why you wanna be a physician and you don't support this helping people and how you wanna help people. So remember there are hundreds of ways to help people. This cannot be your only reason. You need to try to find more reasons and make sure this is what you wanna do. Uh, you need to be committed to a life long learning, right? This, this doesn't finish. You need to continue studying and you need to, to love doing that and enjoy that lifelong learning. This is a career that is more than a job. Um, again, we cannot say, you know, in the emergency room when it's five o'clock and my patient is suffering or dying, well, it's five o'clock, I need to go. This, this is not, doesn't work like that, right? It's, it's, it's a career more than a job and you need to understand that. And also you may wanna have this desire to advance knowledge, right? Pushing the boundaries. And the last thing that I think is very important to mention is that medicine is about at least a desire to solve problems. Sometimes we cannot solve problems as physicians, but that is our goal, right? And those problems are health related. So hopefully you can put together your story when you explain why, why you wanna be a physician and explain how this helping people, how this interest in science, how these other components will have the final goal of improving health, okay? So additional to these reasons, we also hear other reasons and believe it or not, uh, this, this is not that uncommon. We hear people that say, well, is well paid, that's why I wanna do it, right? And then that could be an additional reason, but not your only reason, um, because I can do this. When you evaluate your academic credentials, your abilities, your experiences, I've had students that said, I have everything to be a physician, but when I ask why, I really cannot find good reason, reasons and the passion to do this and the other um, reasons that we talked about before, so this, this is a very important um, time for you to reflect on your reasons and make sure you are not carried by the current in your lab, in your family, um, 
because everyone else is applying to medical school or because my parents expect that or because my PI expects, expects that. We have the situation at the NIH, sometimes PIs are MDs, the PIs are principal, principal investigators and they expect the, the postdoc to be a physician or a researcher or a physician scientist and then there is some pressure there. So this is your career, this is your life and hopefully you will have the opportunity to, to explore enough to make sure uh, that you select the, be the best fit for you and here there is not right or wrong, right? It, it has to be a good fit for you. You need to be happy and comfortable with your decision, but hopefully it's going to be an informed decision, right? And I also read in several personal statements that people mention house or Grace Anatomy as the reasons why they want to be a physician. So make sure you have a stronger reasons and you are actually um, basing this decision in, in real situations. Um, and then I, I always like to hear from you about some qualities doctors should have. Uh, doctors and also medical school students, right? And we know that some of you in your personal statements, in um, the conversations we have with you, you have good reasons to say, oh, this is preparing me for medical school. This is preparing me to be a better doctor. So I'd like to invite you to go ahead and type in the question box, what are some qualities you think doctors should have? I have a list here and we can compare and try to do this a little bit more interactive. So let me go to questions now and see if I can see what you are entering here and I can share with you. So I am seeing here um, compassion, to be personable, empathetic, compassion again, very important, right? Determination, resilience, honestly, flexibility, compassion. So you, you are all um, mentioning very important things. Um, some, some are repeated. I'm just so happy to see um, so common skills that you find important. Altruism, good listeners, right? Patience. I always say you need to be patient with your patient, right? Caring, dedicated, resilient. Okay, so I think we are uh, on the same lines. Tenacity, cooperative, adaptability, empathetic. Okay, great. So I think we all recognize hardworking, confident. Fantastic, thank you. You need to be a leader too, right? So let me share the list we have here for you. And then we can see if we are missing something. But I think we are we are good on um, the things you mentioned here. I think possibly all of them are mentioned here. Sometimes we miss some with uh, our smaller groups, but I think everything was mentioned here. Um, capacity to accept you are a human being that um, uh, a post back in previous year mentioned that it's important to remember that sometimes we make mistakes. Hopefully you're going to study very hard so those mistakes are minor but you need to accept that you are a human being, right? So it's important to know all these skills and to recognize where and when you are developing these and also learn more about what medical schools are expecting to see. And for this, the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges, that uh, I'm sure most of you know about this, is an organization that actually um, uh, represents all the accredited medical schools in the US and Canada, and is also in charge of the medical school application. This organization actually um, publish these core competencies for entering medical school students. So these are 15 core competencies and they are divided in four categories, interpersonal, intrapersonal, thinking and reasoning and science. So I'm going to go briefly here but you will find a hyperlink in this section so you can explore that in more detail. I think these competencies are very important for you to learn to read and to reflect because sometimes you already have developed some but uh, it's not so easy to identify them. 
So for example, here in the interpersonal competencies, we have service orientation, social skills, cultural competence, teamwork, oral communication, right? Sometimes you have these jobs that look like are not related to science or to medicine, but you develop a lot of social skills or communication skills and teamwork, and probably also cultural competence. So make sure that you um, show all these competencies when you apply to medical school and you recognize that these are important factors for your application. When we talk about the intrapersonal competencies, ethical responsibility to self and others, reliability, dependability, resilience, adaptability, capacity for improvement. Again, we can develop these in different settings, the clinical setting and also non-clinical settings. Uh, thinking and reasoning competencies, um, many of you are doing research now, so these um, uh, competencies are developed in that setting, critical thinking, quantitative reasoning, scientific inquiry, reading communication. And we also have finally have finally the science, science competencies. And here we have the living systems in the human behavior. So make sure you review this um, in detail and you recognize and reflect of what competencies you have and what competency, competencies you'd like to develop to have a more balanced application. Now this information, of course, um, is gonna help you to make your decision. Your decision is, is not a light decision, it's an important decision, and this is a, a big commitment, right? Several years, four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, years of residency, a good number of, of years in your life. So you need to make sure that you have all the information and all the experience you need to um, confirm, to make more sure that this is a good path for you. When you say that you are interested in, in the sciences, always remember sciences is broad. Of course, we have the biomedical sciences, but you can actually uh, develop and go into different paths when you are interested in, 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 in science. So make sure that you identify the biomedical sciences and also make sure that there are other health professions there. We have a list here that you can see and we have many options, right? So saying I am interested in health and I am interest, interested in the science may not be enough to explain why you want to be a physician. And you also may want to even explore other options here. So you make sure that that is the option that is the better fit for you. So we're going to expand a little more, a little bit more in medicine, of course, um, the allopathic medicine and also osteopathic medicine. We have a little bit of information about that. So when this idea crossed your mind and you seriously consider that this could be a good option for you, I think that is that is the time when we said you need to prove it, right? Now, just remember that this prove it. Of course, it's going to be in the future for your medical school admissions, but in, in first instance, is proving yourself if you are going to be happy in this environment, if you have all the information you need to make this decision. We have sent the students to volunteer, to shadow, to be in the clinical environment, and, and some of them just doing that realize that they don't want to be surrounded by sick people, that they really don't enjoy that hectic environment. So it is important to prove it for yourself first, right? And then, of course, it's going to be important to have some evidence for your medical school admissions. So we all know that this application is competitive. It has several components, and that is one of the main messages I want to give you today. This is not about your GPA. This is not about your MCAT. This is not about isolated components. This is a combination of several um, important aspects, uh, experiences that will demonstrate that you have explored the career enough and that you can perform well and that you can solve problems because after all this career is about uh, solving problems, right? So we divide the evidence in these sections. Um, of course, we understand that you have this interest in the sciences. You need to demonstrate that you can perform well academically, right? And that you can solve problems. And for that, schools look at your GPA, especially your science GPA, 
and your MCAT score. They also want to see that you have enough clinical exposure. So we divide this clinical exposure in three different experiences. One is clinical volunteering, and, and we really want to be very clear about dividing them in these three different experiences because admissions really like you to be volunteering in the clinical setting as a very succinct and different experience than other ones, right? So they would like you to have the experience to be a volunteer to serve your community, community in the clinical setting. Let's say you go to volunteer in an emergency room or any other part of a hospital or a clinic, right? Where you can see what the environment is about. What, what do you see as a big picture? Um, what is the information you can get about the medical profession? So remember, when you go to these kind of experiences, you are going to be most of the times, so, or at least at the beginning, stocking shelves or wheeling patients, suffering water, things that doesn't look uh, very related to healthcare. However, you are doing several things in, during those experiences. You are communicating with patients. You are surrounded by patients and see how you feel. You are developing your oral and communication skills. I, I always ask this question when I uh, talk to my students about the first day they volunteered in that hospital or that clinic, how you introduce yourselves, how you talk to the patients the first day, the first week. It's, it's still weird the first times, but then after some time, it's just so natural. You go introduce yourself, ask what the patients need, and you start developing this confidence to talk to patients, right? And admissions would like you to develop those skills and to learn about that environment too. So while you are also stocking shelves and talking with the patients, you also see who is the leader of that medical team. You see the dynamics in a hospital. You observe challenges, right? So make sure that when you go to these experiences, you really take advantage of this opportunity. This is an opportunity to be in that hospital, witnessing and learning from the environment. Sometimes I hear some comments from students saying, well, this is so boring, I am only um, stocking shelves or things like that. Remember that your goal is not to master stocking shelves, right? This is, this is just the reason you can find to put your feet on the door there and then being able and take advantage of the opportuni opportunity to be in that hospital of serving physicians, of serving the medical team, of serving the leadership of these doctors, and also interacting with patients. So this clinical exposure is very important. Clinical volunteering is different from shadowing. When you shadow, you are just observing the physicians, right? There are two kinds of shadowing. The passive shadowing, when you don't have a direct interaction with the physician uh, or the patient, and it's just easy to get distracted, distracted with other things and don't take advantage of the whole experience. So we always recommend that when possible, you use active shadowing. Active shadowing involves knowing a little bit more about what kind of patients you are going to see, probably reading before to learn more about that disease. You are um, you are not a doctor yet, right? So you, you need to go ahead and, and have the initiative to review these kind of um, um, problems, health problems, and learn more about them. So when you are there witnessing how the doctor interacts with the patient, understand a little bit more what is happening, right? You also learn about what is the approach the doctors have, how patients respond, you also see the impact these doctors have on those patients, right? You see what happens if this person with a broken leg comes to the uh, emergency room or this person with appendicitis comes to this uh, intense pain. What would happen if doctors don't intervene? What is the impact these doctors have on those patients, right? So make sure that you observe these situations and try to understand what is the role these physicians have. This is especially important when we talk about the reasons why you want to be a physician or when you write your personal statement. 
because very, very often students talk about how um, great was to hold that patient's hand in, in providing comfort to the patient. And then you can even recognize some of these um, kind of uh, attitudes from, from physicians. But you only focus on that kindness and that comfort and you don't go beyond that and explain how doctors use this kind of interaction to finally fulfill their goal, which is improving health, right? So yes, you, you wanna be kind to the patient, um, but you, you have a, an ultimate goal. You develop this trust to have more information, to diagnose better and to treat better, right? So make sure that you nail on all these uh, stages of the interaction and not only in the comfort or in being kind, because if you wanna be kind to people, you don't need an MD for that. If you wanna provide comfort, you don't need an MD for that. However, you need that as the first stage to improve health. So make sure you describe all the process and you observe all the process when you are shadowing. So those two are very important for medical school admissions. Sometimes uh, the students have worked, have done clinical jobs, and that is also important. They may have a good uh, experience witnessing and shadowing and observing doctors at the same time. However, the clinical jobs don't replace your clinical volunteering. And I'm gonna show you some graphs so you understand better what I'm talking about. Medical school admissions really care about your clinical shadowing separate from your clinical volunteering, okay? All right, there are other things that are important for your application, non-clinical volunteering. Um, you guys talk a lot about helping people when you explain your reasons why medicine, when you write those personal statements. And sometimes you have zero involvement with your community. So only saying that you want to help people and not showing your commitment, your interest in helping your community during years is, is not something that really supports that first statement. So make sure you support the, your community with community service because medical school admissions are going to see that and are going to value that. And, and hopefully that's something you really want to do and you are not just checking the box, right? Research is also a very important part of your application. Um, for people who come to the NIH, it's very important that they have this full-time research experience. They develop a lot of skills, but you also develop many skills doing research in your undergrad institution. So that's a, a very important factor uh, that medical school admissions value. Your leadership, as we already mentioned, is uh, you can recognize very soon that the doctors have this leadership role in the field. So it's important that you start developing those skills. And that could be, you can start developing those skills, tutoring, mentoring, um, during jobs related to medicine or not. These leadership skills are very important and they don't have to be closely related to medicine to really highlight the skills you learn there. There are gonna be other extracurricular activities that are important for you. Include everything in your application and try to develop and really dive in those experiences that are more important for you. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the invisible applicant and why it's so important to have at least something when, when where you are really, um, performing an outstanding experience. When they see that you have, you know, involved for years in this kind of community, or you have developed these outstanding leaderships with this other community, something that really highlights your application. Okay, so we are gonna go to um, how to put together this competitive application. And for that, I'm, I'm gonna, briefly stop here and um, just make sure I don't have like urgent questions. 
Is there anything, Kristen, that I do think I need to handle now? Um, can you just mention um, briefly about COVID and how that's affecting experiences and what students could do sure. while they're, yeah, thank you. I have a couple of slides uh, a little bit later, so be patient. Okay. I'm going to okay. cover that for sure. Anything else I need to cover right now, you think? No, I don't think so. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead. I know we're going to have a lot of questions and we're going to try to respond as many as we can. And, and at the end, I'm going to give you a couple of resources that are going to be very important for you to um, answer those questions. All right, so I have my second poll here. So you are awake and we are all more active. Uh, let's see if you can try to guess. Please don't Google, don't Google. It's just what you think about uh, what is the percentage of the applicants that really matriculate, okay? So you have this, you can answer now. I'm gonna give just a few seconds. So this is really what you think and, and not um, the information you could get from the internet. Okay, so I'm gonna stop collecting very quickly because this is just your feeling, right? Okay, great, so let's close this and uh, let's share. And I can see that 55% of you think is 40% and you have done your homework. And, and I always have this um, kind of response. Many of you think that it's much more harder. 18% think that it's 5% of the people who apply. 25% of you think that it's 15%. So 40% is actually the answer actually 40.9%. Um, and if we see this um, with a different perspective, more than half of, of these people are not getting in. So this, this is not that easy, but if you, don't, if you do your homework, if you really follow all the advice we are giving you and the AAMC is giving you, you have much more chances to get in, right? Okay, so, Tips for your application. We need to identify as soon as possible what are the strengths and the weaknesses you have so far. And, and we already saw that most of you are now senior, junior year. So we are we're still on time to do a lot of things to strengthen your application. Let's start with the courses and the academic performance. So we already know that they want to see your GPA, especially your science GPA, and your MCAT. When we talk about what numbers are competitive, let me tell you this is a very hard question because we cannot give a number for every single school. You know that every single school has different um, numbers, different stats for um, accepting applicants. So for this, we really use a very important resource called MSAR. Hopefully most of you have heard about that. That is the Medical School Admission Requirements website. They have a database with all accredited um, US and Canadian medical schools, and you can actually see a lot of information there. And we're gonna explain what. You need to pay for that if you don't have financial aid program, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but the Regular price, $28 for a year. This last year they changed to $36 for two years. You have that option too. So it is really worth it. On this website, you have requirements that we know that several years ago, it was just easier to advise about requirements. And after um, the, the new MCAT came, the requirements changed from school to school. So you really wanna check. Let me give you a quick look of how this looks like and let me just try to put this a bit bigger so you can see. So you see, for example, these kind of courses and then you can see if this school requires or recommends these courses and then if, you, if they accept AP courses, online, community college, et cetera. So this is a very helpful website and you have this information for every single school. The other thing you wanna take a look, as we were saying, is the GPA and the MCAT for the students they are matriculating, right? And 
very important information to select your schools and to see if you are competitive is also the number of students in a state and number of students or percentage of students of out of a state. You can also see the matriculants pro profile and other information that may be useful. So let's start with um, the average GPA and, and let me just repeat this. This is the average GPA for applicants and matriculants, but this doesn't mean that this number is gonna take you everywhere. You really need to go to every single school, and I'm going to show you an example, where you need to check what are the competitive numbers for that school, right? Now, if you go to the median, you are going to make sure that uh, these numbers are going to take, you are going to make you successful in a good number of schools in the nation, right? So for the GPA, science GPA, 3.66 for matriculants. Uh, just let me go back to mention the applicants 3.48. So just, just to have an idea, the difference between applicants and matriculants. And then for the MCAT, applicants 506, matriculants 511.5. So yes, if you wanna be competitive for the average school in the nation, this would be the number. This number may be in the lower end or, or even out of the range for some top tier schools. This could be in actually the upper tier and uh, upper end of some other schools. This is just the average, right? So you make sure that when you select your schools, you need to check these numbers. Uh, these sections and the MCAT are important. Make sure you always check the number uh, and the scores in these sections because sometimes you guys have a very high two sections and very low other two sections and you only see the overall number and you really need to see that you are competitive in all the sections that are important right for md phd candidates the numbers increased uh, science gpa is 3.77 for matriculants total gpa 3.8 and for mcad um, 516 for matriculants so this is this is a definitely a more competitive application However, I wanted this time to include this chart because I think this explains what uh, we, have, we have been seeing at the NIH. Yes, of course, your MCAT is very important and your GPA is very important, but for MD-PhD candidates, your research is also very important. So if you see the MCAT scores for MD-PhD programs in the nation last year, you will see that the range is actually huge, right? From 501, to 528 and the, as we said already the, the mean is 516. So um, I have to admit I haven't seen 501s at the NIH getting into MD-PhD programs but I have seen people with 507, 508 which you will think that is so far away from the median or from the average. However I have observed that these students have a lot of research several publications, several first author, lots of teaching, leadership experiences. So um, I think the MD-PhD programs are not for everyone. They are really for a very small group of people who really want to go this, this long journey to um, be experts in both fields. But if you find that this is the career for you, don't, don't get so discouraged if you have a lower MCAT, lower than 516, because if you have everything else very strong, especially your research and your publications, you may have more chances than you think. Okay, so this is what you can see in MSAR. This is a screenshot for the MCAT score. This is the University of Virginia. So the way it is presented, you have the median score, and then you have another circle showing uh, the 25th to 75th percentile. And then you have uh, the other information, the other light um, oval that covers the 10th to 90th percentile. This is very important when you want to evaluate your scores for that particular school, because you really want to be at least in the 25th to 75th percentile. Hopefully, most of your schools, you are going to be close to the median, right? So you have more chances to be called for an interview. 
The same for GPA, you are going to have median and percentile range 10 to 90th and 25th to 75th. A new thing that MSAR started offering, uh, like I think two years ago, was the option to look at stats from in-state and out-of-state applicants. And this has been very helpful because if you go to the same web website, you will see, for example, here, okay, that you have by default selected the all accepted applicants, right? And you see the median MCAT score 519 and the 25th percentile 518. So if you are an in-state student, you can go ahead and click on this option and go to the in-state applicants. And let's say you have, a, let's say a 516. Now your application looks very different, very close to the median, right? That you compare with all accepted matriculants. So it is uh, all accepted applicants. So be sure, make sure that you check and explore this option in MSAR because a lot of people don't know that they can change this option. So you, you will always, always go to in-state, obviously in your in-state schools and out-of-state in your out-of-state schools. This is a very, very cool feature that was open recently. We have been using that a lot. All right, so yes, stats are important and your experiences are important. And what one of the main points I wanna make today is that if you realize at this point that you are not meeting the criteria we just talked about, or you didn't meet the criteria if you are just close to um, apply, Make sure that you show that you are doing ongoing efforts and ongoing progress, that you realize you need to do that and you are working on that. So let's start again with what, how, how to nail, how to fix some issues in your application. Let's say that um, for whatever reason, you don't have the GPA that is competitive for the series of schools you wanna apply to. And, and for here, I really need to emphasize here with you that fixing a GPA um, is hard. It takes more time. It takes more effort. Sometimes even it takes more money. So when my undergrad students, when we have these summer workshops, ask about the importance of GPA, I always say, this is your time to perform well academically. Put all your efforts there. We know that you need to develop some leadership skills. You want to have this clinical exposure. You can have it little by little. Don't let your grades suffer because fixing that is going to take you much more time. That is just harder. So focus on your performance. And I know sometimes there are some personal issues, other things, and, and sometimes it's just not possible. But whenever possible, Try to perform as well as possible because this is an important factor in your application. And if this suffers during your undergrad, you graduate and then fixing that may take longer and it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. Still, I can give you examples of people who can uh, have done you know, post -bac, uh experiences or masters, but I can tell you that that's much harder than having competitive clinical hours or community service. So let's say that you don't have a very competitive science GPA. So depending on the schools you wanna go, you may need just to take some courses to improve that a little bit more. If your GPA is really below um, in the lower end in those schools you wanna apply, you may need to take a post -bac um, course-based post -bac program or a master's program. And those have the purpose of enhancing your academic um, credentials. So you can see here at the AAMC, there is one website and you have the link here to look for those post -bacs. These opportunities will have a lot of science courses and of course you are expected to perform really well so you can balance that low science GPA you have in your undergrad. So this could be an option for you 
um, regarding your GPA. If you are not performing well in your MCAT, you need to really evaluate if you need to study for yourself, if you need a group study, if you need to take courses, if you need to take more or less guides. And for that, I strongly recommend you to um, watch these two webinars, Preparing for the MCAT Part 1 and Part 2. Dr. Sukowski was great in presenting those at the beginning of this year, and they have been very useful for our students at the NIH. So use your handouts, use these links to register for the webinar and watch it when you have time. There are very important resources there, free resources um, to access materials and practices. So I strongly recommend you to do that. The MCAT is not a test that you take just to see what happens. I've heard several times this from my students. I know it was not the best option. I just wanted to see what happened. Maybe I was lucky. Your MCAT is gonna be there forever. It's not removed from your application, even if you have a better score uh, the next time. So I strongly recommend you to seriously prepare for this test and use all the strategies possible so you can get the score you want for the schools you wanna to apply to. There are several full length practices from the AAMC website and from other companies. Make sure that you take this well in advance to work more on the areas you need to work more. And then be a little bit more sure, I know it's hard to be 100% sure, but be, be a, little, a little bit more sure about um, the score you are gonna get that day. So you decide if this is the good time to take it or you need to postpone it. Some people postpone it, some people take it twice, some people take it three times. Yeah, and some people ask me, some students, is it gonna look bad if I take it again a second time? And I said, well, if you have a 502, that's gonna be worse than don't retaking it, right? So you need to go for that score you need, even if you take, you need to take it more than once. So make sure that that MCAT score is compatible to, or competitive to the, uh, school you are, are planning to apply to. In terms of clinical exposure, again, um, we were saying at the beginning, these are clinical volunteering and shadowing are different in both necessary um, experiences for your application. Start collecting these hours, start having this experience and learning from them, right? Number of hours for this experience vary a lot from school to school. There are schools that really wanna see several thousands, some schools are much more flexible. I would say the clinical volunteering hours for the average school uh, would go, I would say minimum between, between 150 and 200 for clinical volunteering. For shadowing, probably between 80 or 100 hours and make sure you shadow different specialists. So you make sure that you have a good spectrum of um, the medical career try that to be an active shadowing too and uh, make sure that you have at least these two and if you have been working uh, with physicians scribing or doing other clinical jobs that's great that may in some capacity replace the shadowing but that doesn't replace the clinical volunteering so as you can see if we are talking about 100 hours 150 200 that's something that if you start early enough you, this, you do this in a regular base, you can accumulate a good number of hours in two or three years. So I strongly recommend you that if you haven't done this yet, you start planning for this, don't spend a lot of time, right? The, the medical school admissions don't work like that. They don't wanna see this accumulation of hours in the previous two or three months um, before the application. They wanna see that you have this, long-term interest that you have been working for several years. And that is even wise and convenient for you because you don't wanna be you know, distracted with this or using a lot of your time while you have your courses, when you have your research also going on. So start this as soon as possible and um, try to make sure that you have a good plan so when you apply, you have enough hours and you can really talk about this exploration 
this um, learning from the medical profession. When people have 20 hours volunteering and 12 hours shadowing, I've heard so many times admissions saying, this person just doesn't have the information he or she needs to apply to medical school. So make sure that goes strong. That's very, very important. And I'm going to emphasize this several times because you will see later when I show the charts of um, GPA and MCAT, how important this is. There are people with stellar numbers, very high MCAT score, very high GPA, science GPA. And we have seen these people in our office, 520s. I have 520s, 3.8, 3.9 science GPA with zero interviews. And the first reason for this is the lack of clinical exposure. There are other reasons bad personal statements, bad interviews, but the first reason is the lack of clinical exposure. So make sure that this component is strong in your application. Now, of course, we have the question in this time, right? Clinical volunteering during the pandemic, how we can do this um, and how can we fix if we haven't continued with this experience? So I've heard different comments from admissions some of them have said, you know, we expect that you really started exploring the medical career years before and not four months before the application is open, right? So I think that if for whatever reason, because you change your mind, because of personal reasons or uh, other reasons that you may have, if you don't have enough clinical volunteering, if you don't have enough community service, enough shadowing, and you were planning to do everything in these four months and then the pandemic came, if that happened, I strongly recommend you to reconsider applying this year. You may need to apply next year because you need to show that you have enough information to make this decision. And without that exploration and that exposure, it's gonna be hard to explain that, right? Now, if you already have enough clinical hours and you are just showing continuity, that's totally fine. If you started something in January, February, and you only did that for a few hours, you can, only, you can always include this experience in AMCAS and just say that this will continue when the uh, pandemic situation passes and the clinical volunteering options opened again. It's important to say that once you have started something, you can report that in AMCAS. But if you were only planning to do it at some point and you never started, you cannot include that information in AMCAS. So make sure that you reflect on this and you decide whatever uh, shows a stronger experiences for you. In terms of <clears throat> volunteering during this time, there are some options out there, but I just don't feel comfortable putting a list of options here because we know that you need to evaluate your personal situation. Many of you have come back home. Many of you live with your parents and your parents may have some conditions that put them in risk. Some of you even live with grandparents. So you really need to evaluate your personal situation and make sure that you serve your communities in a clinical setting without putting yourselves or others at risk. I have people working um, screening at the NIH for COVID. I have people working in um, the blood donation sites. I have people working in, in other clinical places, but they have evaluated the situation and they are not at risk and they are not putting someone else at risk. So you really need to evaluate this. And yes, there are some options out there, especially probably the last weeks, uh, more options are opening. So this is one of the charts I really wanted to show you because this is from the University of Maryland. And this is the pre-medical experiences of first year class. You see here several, several experiences. Let me see if I can magnify some and then I'll go because this is a very small font. 
But the community service, and this is uh, over the last four years, is a very important component of the application. 99% of the, uh, these first year students had this experience. For this particular school, military service services is not something that they require. Shadowing uh, experiences, let me go back to the big picture, shadowing experiences, clinical volunteering and research, you can see that these four categories are on the top. Almost everybody has that. And if you don't see 100% here in all of these, it's most probably because, because some of them are mixed with leadership or with clinical jobs, and then it decreases the 100%, but these are like very constant experiences that medical school admissions require. So please be careful and check that shadowing is different from clinical volunteering. I have this question so often. It's not the same. Some people say, I already volunteered. I don't need to shadow. And you, don't, you didn't see doctors in action. You saw them in the big picture, but you didn't see them actually treating patients, right? Some people say, I already have shadowing. And then you haven't served your community. You haven't seen this, the big picture of the profession and you haven't learned more about the hospital environment, the dynamics and the challenges. So you learn different things from these experiences. Make sure you have both. And of course, your community service is also very important too. Um, I almost never emphasize so much research because we usually give these seminars to people at the NIH who are already there for one year or two years. But if you are in your under, undergrad institutions and you haven't had a lot of research experience, I strongly recommend you to explore this more or even considering a gap year doing research may be something helpful for you. All right, so going back to the um, competitive application, yes, we already covered the clinical exposure, the non-clinical exposure, we just mentioned that. Community service is super important. Everybody says you want to help people. You need to show that you have been helping people, right? Um, your research experiences, your leadership, and other extracurricular. So let's go to the community service, especially during this time. So I am putting here three websites that you may want to check. Operation Warm with many ways to volunteer virtually. All this is virtual community service, and I think that may be a good way to spend um, these extra hours that some of you have during this summer, uh, and these other two organizations, both for virtual volunteering. Uh, and then I, I was going to emphasize here that community service non-clinical is as important as the clinical for your medical school application. Don't forget that. Okay, so we have talked a lot about, um, okay, let me pause, drink some water and see if you have questions. It's been an hour already. Uh, is there any question, Kristen, you think I need to answer now? I see a lot of questions here, but I also see that Kristen is trying to answer some of them, or maybe maybe she's not here anymore because she was gonna leave, I think, at three. Okay, so um, I'm gonna continue with the presentation. Hopefully, I can give you at the end a very good number of resources for you to um, have more answers for these questions if we don't answer them during the presentation and making sure um, you have all this process clear. So the next section I really want to discuss and emphasize is the importance of the numbers, right? Because many of you say, I am studying for the MCAT, I need to dedicate my 100% of my time, I, yeah, I haven't volunteered, I haven't shadowed, but I know if I have a 520, I am done. And let me tell you that is not true. So the chart I am presenting to you today is the acceptance rate when you compare GPA and MCAT score. So I'm going to start, I know this is a very loaded um, slide, but I just want to make sure that you understand this process. So here you see, for example, acceptance rate, and you will see GPA from lower than this and then going up 
until we reach 3.60 to 3.79 and then uh, higher than 3.79 so 3.8 and up right and then in the other part of the chart we have MCAT score and you can see here going from 480 something different range and then we have at the very last uh, right up corner we have MCAT score greater than 570 so 518 and higher so as you can see a 518 is actually a very competitive number right and then the MCAT um, the sorry the GPA that we have on the left at this point is 3.8 or higher so this person this group of people have stellar numbers 3.8 518 right and as you can imagine of course the better the stats the higher the acceptance rate that in general works and, and that you can see that very clearly here if we go to this upper corner again you will see that if you have this MCAT score and this GPA you have 8.9 and then 17 23 percent 33 50 percent 62 70 80 so the more you approach the right uh, up corner top corner you will see higher acceptance rate but i want you to pay attention to this particular one let me put the laser so i can point this out so i don't know if you can see this from um, this group of people have 518 and 3.8 or higher and 87.8% of them get in. So this is a very good percentage, right? However, if you think carefully, almost 1,000 people with these numbers don't get in. I'd like to ask you, what did you think about someone who has a 3.8 and a 518 or 519 or 520? I think most of you will say, done great application great strong student right strong applicant however as i told you before this is not only about numbers yes numbers are important but they are not the only factors here the application really has different several important components to take into consideration so more than 12 percent of people with these stats don't get in almost 1000 people last year with these stats don't get in so make sure that you understand that this is not only about numbers now let's see this other group because i think it's also important to see the group that has oh what did i do um, okay let me go back okay so let me just amplify this section uh, i think it's impossible to have all the numbers here but you can see, and I can tell you, these people have 3.2 to 3.4. So 3.2 to 3.4, you know that this is not like very competitive um, GPA. MCAT scored not very competitive, 502 to 505, right? You may say this person doesn't have a chance. However, 21% of these people get in. Now, I'm not encourage, encouraging you to have these scores. You need to push the, the more, the more you can right however you need to be aware that all these other aspects in your application are very important so i've seen people at the nih with 505 some of them 507s 509s with um probably an average or lower mcat score than uh, sorry gpa uh, 3.4 but they have very strong community service, very strong clinical volunteering, very strong shadowing experiences, leadership, and other things, right? So this is not black and white. They really see a different aspects of the application. And it's very important to understand that not everything is about numbers and you need to be aware of that. Okay, so briefly, when you choose your schools, make sure that um, you don't look at numbers only. Actually, the way we recommend you to choose your schools is checking the curriculum. And I know sometimes the curriculum is very similar among schools, but some, some schools have something different. Um, 
what is the research focus if you are interested in doing research, what is the community they serve. Sometimes I talk to students that say I really want to focus on uh, these schools because they serve the underserved communities or they serve the Native American communities around or the Hispanic communities or whatever minority or not minority community, whatever it is your interest, you can check for the schools who have uh, who are in these environments when they serve in particular one community. Some of them, um, some of these options um, are also important to choose like location, right? You want to be in the city, you want to be in a rural area. These are important factors for you to choose schools. You want to be close to your family, you want to be close to your support system. You need to choose the schools that are in that area you are interested in. This is a personal interest, right? And you need to make sure that you also weigh these factors. Whether, if it's important for you, I can tell you that I always thought weather was not important for me. And when I chose my um, PhD place in Northern England, when it's very cold and gray and rainy, I suffered for a few months or years, right? Everyone is different, but sometimes if you haven't had the exposure, you don't know. So if for some of you, weather is important, take that into consideration when you select the schools. We have 150 something schools, right? So you really can choose. Um, other factors like legacy. And when you have all these personal factors involved in that equation, then you can select by numbers, right? GPA, MCAT, in a state and out of a state. So let me share with you one tool we use at the office. You can do the same only for your school. This is a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet when we actually put the name of, we have this with every single school, but you can just make your list according to the personal factors we talked about here. That may be a list of 25, 30 schools, and then after doing that, you put the numbers in. So you make sure that every single school that is on that list is a good fit for you, and you would be very happy going to that school. You put the numbers in, and then you can have a better idea where you are gonna be competitive, right? And we recommend that at least to have 10 schools where your numbers are on the target number, right? Your, uh, the median they have is your number. Most of your schools should be like that, so you can assure interviews, right? And we're assuming the rest of your application is strong. What happens, let me go back to the previous uh, slide, what happens when you only see this, or you first see GPA and MCAT? You end up selecting schools that you even don't know. You just saw the numbers. You can get the interviews there. You are accepted there and you realize that you didn't want to go there. And for some of you, it happens that you were only accepted to that school. And let me tell you that when you declined an acceptance, that's really a red flag in your application. They want to see that you took your time to explore the different options and choose those schools where you really want to go, right? So the, the selection of the schools is very important. Make sure you're taking, you take into consideration all these aspects and then you put the numbers and select those where you are more competitive. And of course, there is always the chance to ap apply to these two or three schools that are much higher than your numbers because you never know, right? And some two or three schools below your numbers because you never know. So having a good spectrum, okay? Great. I want to make a comment about legal residence. So you know that if you are a resident of um, most of the states, you have a preference in public schools and sometimes even in private schools. So you need to make sure that you know your residence and that when, when you, for whatever reason, need to change need to move to another place. And this happens very often at the NIH. You have your permanent residence in Colorado, 
and you come to the NIH for the postback and you end up staying here for two years and you start changing your driver license and you change your permanent address and then without knowing you are losing your residency there. So you need to make sure what are the eligibility requirements to keep the residence if you want to keep that one, the one that uh, is usually the permanent one, because that uh, residence is going to give you some preference there, right? So it's important to know that now, so the changes you are making in the, in the next years don't affect your residency. The other important thing I want to emphasize today, and this happens every year, you need to apply as an out-of-state to schools where you really have a chance. There are some schools that are very in-state, that really gives a strong preference to in-state students. And then if you're an out-of-state, your chances may be very low. If your chances are very low, or even zero in some cases, don't apply there. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money in secondaries and your time filling them out, etc. when you don't have a lot of chances there, right? You need to be very smart when you choose these schools. And I want to show you what happened with UC Riverside every year. So UC Riverside, as you can see here, um, is a school from California that accepts zero percent of out of state. So they are 100 percent in state school. Let me see if I can amplify this. So zero percent out of state, 100 percent in state, right? So if you are not from California, and actually they are very regional, but that's another thing. If you are not from California, your chances getting there for the last several years has been zero. And what happens with the students? Every year, every single year, hundreds and sometimes thousands of students apply to Riverside from out of state. So it's very clear that these people are not reviewing the data, right? So last year it was 25%, this year is even higher the percentage, 28.5%. 20, More than 1,000 from these, almost 6,000 people, more than 1,000 are out of, out of state and have zero chance to get into that school. So make sure that you review this data in state and out of state. I am putting here what is the table you need to check from the AAMC facts. So you uh, study this, check this information, and only apply to schools when you have a better chance. My favorite number for out of state is that they receive at least 40%, so you have a little bit more chance to get called for an interview. This information is also in MSAR. I think it's not as clear as I see it here. I, I always print out my copies and put all together my Excel chart. So you can check this information here publicly at the AAMC facts table A1, or if you have access to MSAR, you can also say, uh, see that there. To select your schools, you also can use uh, the US News report. Uh, you know, it's controversial, the ranking they have there. They may give you an idea about the ranking in research, uh, best medical schools in terms of research or primary care. Some people report this is more useful to have like the medical programs and specialties. And if you click on here, you will have the ranking by specialties. So this can be also useful. So we said 12 to 15 schools, and hopefully at least 8 to 10 of those are going to be in the target numbers, in the immediate numbers for those schools. For the first year, in many years, the MSAR advisor reports, which were like only open to advisors, and we had this statement about you cannot share with the students, etc. From the first time, they are open to students because of the COVID situation. So if you can open these files, they are very helpful, a lot of useful information, admission policies and information, application timeline. You can find um, what schools are accepting courses, um, online courses, pass and fail, which schools are actually 
part of this call to action policy uh, or accept uh, pass or not credit grades for, for this spring. We have seen a lot of things and let me share you this information because we are seeing people who were planning to take a lot of science courses and now they had to take them pass and fail. And the bad thing is that even that they will take them into consideration for prerequisites, they are not going to account for your science GPA, right? So if you were planning to increase your GPA with these courses and now this happened, yes, they are going to be taken as prerequisites in your schools, but it's not going to help you to increase your science GPA. So every case is going to be different here to choose what is the most convenient situation for you. Anyway, as a summary, it is important at this point to make a plan, right? If you are in high school, you already heard a lot of information about what is coming. If you are in your first, second year of college, I think you have a good time to plan. If you are um, in uh, senior year, junior year, senior year on a post back, you still have also time to plan and strengthen this application. So the plan is what works here. I want to make sure I have a sense of how many people are applying this, this cycle and next cycle. So let me do this very quickly and see when you are applying to medical school. If, oops, oh, I'm so sorry. I closed it beforehand. Uh, let me see if I can launch it again. Mm. Give me one second. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna have the chance to do this. So um, I, I think we may have more people applying this cycle and next cycle, just given the audience um, we had, we explored at the beginning. So it is, it is just important to work on this application and plan accordingly, right? To the, to the time you are applying. You need a balanced application. Doesn't matter if you have a 524. 528, right? If everything else in your application is weak, your, your chances are much lower. So make sure you actually include everything that we have talked about in terms of important experiences. And at the end here, I included hobbies and other ways to take care of yourselves and release your stress, because sometimes you don't include this in AMCAS and medical school admissions need to know that you have an outlet, that you have uh, other things to share. You are a well-rounded candidate and not everything is about academic uh, uh, experiences, okay? So make sure you have this balanced application. I really want to share with you this phenomenon that we have been seeing, the phenomenon of the average, sometimes invisible applicant. So students with average or lower end stats, with average number of, of hours or lower end number of hours for your experiences. Not very strong personal statement, but not so bad, right? So this kind of average lower end student, which otherwise you'd say, I think would have a chance to, to get into medical school, they are not seen. Many of them are what we call the invisible applicant. So, what I really like to share with you is that I have seen, according to our experience, that when you have one aspect of your application really outstanding, your leadership is really outstanding, or your community service, or your research, um, you may have more chances to be seen. So don't um, just rely on the numbers for the average. Don't settle because you already have 80 hours of shadowing and 150 of volunteering. They look like the minimum, right? Try to, to push those boundaries and really try to highlight, to explore more, to go beyond the minimum and show that you can have a passion for something and you can explore door that just beyond the average hours or the average expectation. I think that's a, an important comment to make. All right, so it's already 3.22 and I know I, need, I really need to finish very soon. Thank you, Natasha, for that comment. Um, so for 
the tips for the application, I think I'm going to skip those. Um, I have a few slides about the actual application. I have a webinar and I have the link here. So you have a guide, you have videos, you need to know that you really don't need your MCAT score to submit, but it's very healthy to have your MCAT score to submit. So just think about that, and I explained that in detail in my workshop. Um, you need to submit your application. You know it opens in usually in May, and you, you can submit at the end of May for AMCAS at least. Uh, end of May, with all the coursework, the schools you attended, your uh, essays, your statement, and your experiences, right? You need to contact your schools to send a transcript, and the transcript is um, received by AMCAS, and they use it to verify line by line, by hand, all your coursework. Once they verify that, they deliver your application to schools. And usually schools don't review your application until it is complete, and it's going to be complete until they receive your MCAT. So um, a few things about deadlines. Um, basically apply as early as possible, not when the deadlines are put on the website. I have a lot of students that don't know that really earlier is much better and gives you a huge advantage. Early decision program, in general, we don't recommend it. At least, at, at least you have a good reason to apply only to one school, which is usually not the case. And you have the dates for this cycle. Uh, for people applying this year, they already know, and for people applying in the future is just like a reference. So all this information is in my AMCAS uh, webinar, and this is the link that you can use to watch it. I am adding here some resources for you, like the course classification, because sometimes you don't know that the classification is like this for AMCAS. You need to know that early in the process. And also to tell you that you need to report institutional actions, felonies, and misdemeanors. And you may need to think a little bit more before making these decisions. I have students who really regret, you know, having taken that car and driving under the influence or cheating in that essay or uh, cheating in that test. And what looks simple and just trivial in those years is now affecting them to actually enter medical school. This is an important factor in medical school. So if you have the time to avoid this, try to avoid it. The personal statement is also a very important component for your application. We have some comments here for you. You can read it you know, carefully. We have also this information in the um, webinar. But if you can read this article from Dr. Finkels, I think it summarizes a lot of the things. What I would say now is start journaling because we really ask you to put cases there and you don't remember after two or three years. So journal, put all the information you need in those um, journals. Some comments about what to include and what not to include. Important uh, comments about recommendation letters. This is the time to establish those relationships with your faculty members. Don't think that getting that B plus or that A is going to make them remember you. They need to write a strong letter, and that is not going to happen if they don't remember you. So this is a good time to establish those relationships and use the committee letter from your school if you have one. This is the schedule for the MCAT, the new schedule. I'm sure all of you have seen it on the website, but I just have it here for you. And as always, I think we know that this year it's going to be more flexible, the application, but still, I would say, try to apply as early as possible. Applying early has always given an advantage to our students. So you, I told you you have criminal background checks, and that is very important for the application. There is a fee assistant program that gives you a reduction of the MCAT um, registration fee. Uh, you have the application for free and 20 medical schools for free. So you may want to check the threshold uh, to apply change recently. So you may want to check the information again, even if you checked that before. So in terms of the timeline, um, for people who are far away from the application time, please perform well academically. I don't know how much I need to emphasize that. That is going to save you a lot of time and money and stress. 
and then little by little do your clinical exposure, your shadowing, your community service. Consider a gap year if you need it. For people applying this cycle or next year, yes, you need to work on that MCAT as early as possible. My favorite month is January of the year you are applying, but yes, you can extend. You need to contact your letter writers by March. You need to start working on that application before. So by early June, you can submit. And then you can work on secondaries um, in a brief period of time. We're going to have a seminar about secondaries, so I'm not going to comment anything about that, and I'm going to share the link for you. We have a couple of links for osteopathic medicine and naturopathic medicine if you are interested. We already talked about the cost. I know this is expensive. Um, you need to prepare for the MCAT, buy materials, buy secondary, uh, pay for secondary applications, interview clothes. Although these days you may only use the money for your jacket and your blouse or um, just the top of you, but hopefully not. Hopefully you're going to have the whole suit. But um, traveling, maybe something you can save this year. Anyway, it's important to save some money. So here's some information about the cost from schools, but the important thing here is to emphasize that when you graduate first year post-residency, you usually have a decent salary and you can pay for that. There are other ways to pay for medical school. I'm sharing here some links and some scholarships. I'm not gonna comment on them. This is for people interested in primary care and this is the National Health Service course scholarships. So you can review this in detail. I just want you to know that they are here. Um, if you are from a minority group and you wanna register for the MedMar, please do it. That can be a benefit for you. Second day application workshop is gonna happen this Thursday and you have a link here. You have the handout there in your uh, tabs in the webinar. Make sure that you download the handouts and you have all the links with you for the future references. No COVID-19 question in AMCAS. We already know that, right? However, it can come in many secondaries and also in a commas. So three comments about this question. They don't want you to use this as an excuse, right? Number one. Number two, this is not about checking boxes. So don't explain why you don't have clinical experience because this is actually relatively recent. Make sure you include your personal impact with this situation, right? We all have these personal um, issues that are consequence of this situation. Share with them that, right? And finally, hopefully you change your perspective of the medical school career, the medical profession with this situation. Include that too. I have some, I, I received actually some emails before with some questions. So I included here some things you can do during the summer, some readings, some courses, some resources at the NIH. So I put the links here for our workshops at online resources for pre-meds, uh, the National Advisor Association for Health Professions uh, Fair, professional fair coming up this Thursday, sorry, this Saturday. You have the link here, it's $5 per uh, entrance and I think is very worth it. And we are gonna have our NIH Grad and Professional Fair in August. We don't have the website published yet, but it's coming soon. So please check our website. Uh, and we have other resources there. Um, very importantly, links from the AAMC if you are not familiar with them. But I wanna emphasize that the National Association for Advisors has a tool to locate an advisor in your institution. And if you don't have advisors, they provide free advisors. I, I don't know for how long, but they can actually work with you just in those cases where you don't have an advisor in your institution. So you have the link here. You are gonna have that in your handout. Remember to download it because I think if we close this, you, you don't have it anymore. So you have this resource with you. You have advisors there for free. CASPER is another um, test that many schools are using now for medical school. So you have the information here in a couple of books that you can use. They said there is no way to prepare, but I think if you have this background about ethical issues, you may find 
responding to those questions more easily. We have another workshop, how to prepare for the medical school interview, and you have the link here. You can also, you will have it in your slides. So I was saying the grade is coming up, you just need to visit our website. So finally, and not less importantly, I know that this plan has a lot of things, right? And you may have a lot on your plate. So this is very important. Please take care of yourselves. You need your time. You need to go to the holistic self-care and take care of your body, your mind, your spirit, and your heart. So make sure that you use resources. The OITE, um, has a lot of resources. Um, first, the recognition of the stressful time. I, I know this was not the focus of this talk, but we know how many things are happening now in this country. And it also, I read an article about this cognitive bandwidth. Um, just thinking about this problem sometimes make us hard to dedicate our brain and our um, mental resources to do other things. So make sure that you accept what is happening. Maybe you want to have an active role, whatever, in whatever capacity you want, and you can separate that and focus also in your application. So these are uh, some of the wellness resources at the NIH, some books we recommend, some take messages that you can reflect on when you um, actually Okay, great. So Natasha is telling me that it's okay, I don't need to rush, that maybe you have the time to stay here. I think most of you are here. So uh, I, this is just my last message. Make sure that this is what you want. This is not all about numbers. Remember, your experiences are very important. If you didn't meet the criteria yet, that, that's the clue word, right? Yet, work on that. Work on your timeline, apply as early as possible, and take care of yourselves. And that is my last my last um, slide. So at this moment, I think we just have so many questions that I don't think I can answer all of them. But I see one at the end that says the slides will be available. So the slides are, if you go to the tab that says handouts or resources, handouts. Um, can you see that? For the people who are asking about the slides, please just confirm that you can see the handouts. We have different tabs, right? And then in those tabs, there is one called handout. If you click on that little triangle, you will see drop and drop a file, and then you have their choosing and applying to medical school. You can download it, you can save it. It's a PDF file. Some people, no, we can't see it. Okay, so, um, Go to the Go to Webinar menu and you see different tabs. I, I cannot tell you what I have because I know that as an administrator, I have more tabs than you. But there is the webcam, the audio, uh, the, okay, you found it. Great, fantastic. So go to the one that says Handouts. You have a little red square. It's a PDF file, say, choosing and applying to medical school. So this is what I'm going to do. I see still a lot of people here. I am going to try to answer some questions. Um, oh, it is under the chat box. Um, Natasha is telling me. So great that you are finding it. If you cannot find it, try to find it because I am not very good at my email. I receive just so many emails, I cannot answer every single one. And I have my email here for you. And I would like to offer it for questions, but I already see that we have hundreds. So I'm afraid I cannot uh, commit to respond to all of them, but hopefully you had most of your uh, questions answered. And if not, we have some free resources out there for you. I am going to try to um, answer some questions here. If you need to go, please go. I don't think, Natasha, do you know if we have another seminar, webinar uh, after this one? Okay, so I'm gonna start answering some questions and hopefully this can be a little bit helpful. There will be a new answer for this year. The one you see right now is the new one. They renew it uh, at the end of March, beginning of April. So the one you see now 
is the current one is not going to change during the year and it's good for the year so for people who are discovering this or trying to get the information by november december i would say just wait until january right uh, but if you are already applying you may want to buy it now okay uh, let me see next question i am taking a number of courses from colleges outside my primary one could i turn to these professors for recommendations you can it doesn't matter right as long as you have a transcript from that institution at, at, at uh, as long as this is very clear that this is your professor doesn't matter what institution that is um okay let me see if i can kevin got the slides that's great can you take the MCAT in, say, sophomore year? Oh, that's a very good question. Please, for those who can stay, let's discuss this. Can you take the, um, the MCAT? And there is not, not another workshop, so I am happy to stay here for a little bit longer. In sophomore year, then given that the score is good, not taking it when you apply in junior, senior, senior year. So very, several aspects, very important aspects here. So happy I am reading your questions because I don't think about these questions. Sophomore year, usually you don't have all the important courses that are going to be a foundation for you to perform well at the MCAT, right? So please don't rush. This is not a matter of uh, trying to take it as soon as possible. Make sure that you have your biology, your physics, your biochemistry, all the, the important courses here. First, that's going to be your foundation. After that, Yes, take your MCAT. Most of my students, the students I advise for medical school, already decided to take a gap year. And, and honestly, it probably, I don't know if you know this, but more than 60% of people accepted have taken a gap year. And it's not a backpacking to Europe gap year, it's an enhancing year. So if you are doing research, if you are doing, you are scribing or doing other things, you already finish all your important courses. You can focus on the MCAT preparation. You can do that, let's say you finish your college, you finish just this past May, this is an, a hypothetical case. You can take your MCAT in September. You already took all your courses, right? And you are doing other things, I know. You can even prepare more and take it in January. My ideal situation would be, please don't take it later than January, because if for whatever reasons you are not using the best strategies to study and to excel in that test, you still have the chance to retake it. And a lot of people retake it. There is nothing wrong with that, right? So you have that chance. Putting that so early, two reasons, you don't have the foundations. And number two, the MCAT score expires after three years. So you take it and then the three year is the time of matriculation. So you took it in sophomore year, it may be expired even, even more if you decide to take a gap year. So take into consideration these factors, okay? Foundation, expiration, and then hopefully you decide to take a gap year. And I cannot emphasize harder, the NIH is just a great place to exp uh, expand this extra year or two years. I want to say so many things. Um, you have the research, of course, but you also have a lot of hospitals around. You can volunteer at the clinic. For those of you who are bilingual, we have uh, the interpreting department. People enjoy, the students enjoy doing that and they learn a lot from that. Um, you have shadowing, not a lot, but some shadowing opportunities at the clinical center. You have the pre-med office there for you. You have a lot of resources here. So the NIH is for sure a very good option both for MD and MD-PhD applicants. And of course, there are other good options out there too. So make sure that if you need that year, you strengthen your application during that year, that gives you the chance to study more for the MCAT and you have a better score. Okay, next question. Could you talk about, oh, the baccalaureate in science MD? I would be very happy to do that. Uh, oh, she's offline, so maybe I will not because this is a very particular question. Um, I've taken a number of courses from, oh, okay, I already answered this one. How should we build relationship with the faculty when classes are online? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, usually they have office hours. 
you know, we have, I have sessions every week and I every time ask my students to share their cameras. I prefer to see faces than small squares with names. If you have that chance, share your camera, put a face on that name. It's, it's just easier to remember, ask questions, intervene, um, share articles with the professor, try to find creative ways. I know it's more difficult when this is virtual, but I think this is still possible. So try your best. Um, what else? Can you please recommend any resources dedicated to MD, PhD programs? Yes, of course. We have, oh, I didn't, I don't know if I didn't put the link here, but so, so MD, PhD candidates uh, can send me an email and in the subject, please put MD, PhD webinar link. We have a webinar. I'm happy to share that with you. I, I thought I, I plan to put it here, but I don't remember if I did it. So MD, PhD candidates, yes, I would be very happy to share that webinar with you. Uh, what was the webinar address for what, Sarah? I don't understand. Um, can we contact you directly for personal advice? So this is the situation, but well, I would love to, I sometimes try to do that. The reality is that today we had more than 400 people. And even if I want, I, I know what is happen, what, what is going to happen, because even this happens at the NIH with 200 students. Uh, I, I have tons of emails and I just need to eat and take care of my son and sleep. So I really can cannot commit to respond to every single one of you, but I strongly recommend you to go to the um, National Advisor Association or Association of Advisors, the link I sent in that uh, handout, because they offer, they have um, a good group of advisors who provide free advising sessions for you. What does the application timeline look like if you plan on taking one or two gap years, nothing. I haven't seen any problem when you decide to take two years. Actually, I need to say that the post back research program at the NIH is most of the time for two years. So there is no, not a problem at all if you take two years. They don't care. They value. If you are doing something, learning something and growing, they value that experience. There are schools that do not accept online courses. That is true, although I think most of them are, but yeah, that may be true. Does this mean that prerequisites I take do not count? Should I contact the individual schools? Yes, please. So I didn't, I forgot to mention, but I put a link there when you have, um, well, you have that also in MSAR. You have an, an email to contact the schools. Please contact them um, and make sure that they, that you confirm and they know that the call of action and all the flexibilities they are making this year for this situation, right? Um, okay, there is a question here about residency. And so what are the requisites to be considered a state applicant? That's a great question. And guess what? It depends on every state. Every state that has different rules. So you need to go to your state and um, investigate that there. Oh, this is a very good question. How, how to find shadowing options? Shadowing is always, always challenging. Doctors don't like shadows. They don't want this extra person in the room, right? So the best way to have shadowing hours is contacting your network. If you work with physicians, I would say that that may be one of the best ways to ask your physician, your PI, or um, even in your personal network to shadow them or to recommend you with other person. When people send random emails and ask about, you know, I need, I need more, some people say even, not I want to learn from you. They said I need hours of shadowing, right? Can I shadow? They say no, and, and there are several reasons. The first one looks like you're just checking a box, right? So one of the best ways to approach physicians for shadowing is to start volunteering in this hospital or this clinic. Really observe the different 
approaches of these physicians and choose those where uh, you see that you can learn a lot, that you like that approach, you really want to learn more from them. And then that is going to be the message, right? I, um, I have observed how you approach the patients. I've seen this and that. I'd like to learn more from you. Can I shadow you? You are going to have more chances if you take this approach. Um, sometimes physicians, uh, friends that have physicians, your own personal physician, right? And, and as you can see in these successful options, the personal interaction through you or through a friend is going to make a difference. This random person asking whoever is usually not very successful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is already answered. Oh, there is there's a question about GPA. Okay, so I'm going to take advantage of this question to say, if you have study abroad and they told you that your grades are not going to be taken into account to your undergrad GPA, that may be true, but AMCAS don't care. They will take those into consideration for your BCPM GPA. And I've, I had uh, this situation with a couple of students. They were told this doesn't count. They didn't make a very good effort. So they have bad grades, but they were not worried because they were not going to be taken into consideration for the undergrad GPA. However, when this school sent the transcripts, AMCAS took them into consideration and the GPA, the science GPA, decreased, I would say, significantly. So make sure you always do your best. I am a new URTA, will be starting in July. My question is that I finished undergrad in 2012 with a 3.32, then went to a master's of science program in medical physiology to strengthen uh, your application. And then, oh my gosh, what is that? I just lost it. Here, the graduate, the, the master's was a 4.0, was preparing to enter medical school 2015, and then there was an illness, I'm sorry about that, and then you have gap years. So th this is a very particular question. If, if you are an, at NIH, please feel free to contact us. We, we need to see NIH or see, right? So make sure that you contact uh, Primed Advisors. If you go to the OITE website, you will see um, staff. In staff, you will see Primed Advisors, Dr. Sukowski, who was here before, Dr. John Taborn, and I. And you need to use your NIH credentials to go to the online scheduler, and then you can choose an appointment. That's the only way to have an appointment with us, using the online scheduler. FAS um, School Foundation for Advanced Education in Science Graduate School at the NIH. They count for your science GPA. They provide transcripts and they are calculated, factored in for your GPA. How many non-clinical hours would you recommend? This varies a lot. We have seen that a minimum of 150 could be good, but that's a minimum. Actually, what we see is much more than that. Okay, well, I think my throat <laughs> cannot work anymore, but um, I was just so happy to see so many people here. Uh, please use the resources we provided with the, use all the links that are included in that handout because I think all can be very useful for you. Take care of yourselves. Please remember to use the wellness resources too. That is not less important than the other resources. Take care of yourselves so you survive this process. We have seen so many people burning out and we don't want you to do that. So make sure you use all those resources too. Well, uh, good luck in your application whenever that happens. And um, I hope to see you in the next webinar. So the next one is going to be secondary applications and the next the following one is going to be interviewing 
and these are all open to everyone in the country. Thank you for your attention.